Sylvia, thank you so much for being here. I think you can see that everybody is very excited to have you. I think they're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> if you're hungry, I think we can work on that too in just a few minutes. So we just saw a little bit about Mission Blue and the hope spots that you're working to protect around the globe. Can you just tell us a little more about what defines a hope spot? Well, it is a concept, I suppose, but it's taking a vision to make it real, hope leading to action. It started 15 years ago with a group of scientists who figured out if you could just choose places in the ocean that should be protected no matter what, some places that anybody would say, yes, the Galapagos Islands, not just the land, but the surrounding sea, the waters in the Arctic and the Antarctic. The Antarctic continent protected through international agreement in the 1950s, but they forgot about the ocean. They thought the ocean should be managed, and it's still being managed in order to take creatures out of the sea at a level that simply cannot be sustained. And around the world now, there are, it's a different process. Individuals, champions, nominate places that they know and love and are willing to commit to doing whatever it takes to go from wherever they are in terms of being in good health, to either take care of those places and keep them in good condition, or to restore them. I mean, not far from where we're dining this evening, Shinnecock Bay is a hope spot. You'd say, that's not a very, it's not like Galapagos Islands. <laughs> it's not like the Sargasso Sea. But it is a place where people have committed to come together to take a place that had been degraded and through actions over 10 years has really recovered in a way so that the water is now clearer than it was 10 years ago. Clams have come back, oysters are coming back, seagrasses can prosper because light penetrates through water that now is clearer than it was. And that means if you have seagrass, you've got baby fish, you've got little crabs, you've got a whole host of creatures that otherwise could not survive. So it's cause for hope. And now 166 places around the world and growing. It's a network, not just of hope, although that's kind of important, but it's a network of action, gathering information, data that can be shared across the network and beyond, working with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, the United Nations for Nature, to be able to gather information to access and monitor change over time. We need to know how a place was so that you can see how it is or how you would hope that it could be with action. It's so encouraging, and there is so much important work being done but at the same time, I know you have addressed this problem of apathy or lack of awareness when it comes to the ocean in the general public, right? In June, you did an interview with Time, and you said the most pressing issue facing oceans right now is that lack of awareness that the oceans are essential to our survival. Can you tell us more about that idea that the ocean has a role to play in the survival of the human race and why it's so important? Or just imagine Earth without the blue. Think Mars. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of individuals are saying, well, Earth is in trouble. We can always go to Mars. And they're trying to do I mean, I like the idea of going to Mars. I mean, to look back on Earth from high in the sky, that's part of what transformed the way we think about ourselves. 1968, that first image of Earth from space, it was a shock to see how fragile we really are in a universe that is pretty unfriendly when you think about it. You can't imagine hopping out of a spacecraft or a space suit on Mars. 
<laughs> Where's the atmosphere? Where was the atmosphere? Where was the climate on Earth going back in the early years? Four and a half billion, billion, big B, billion years ago. There was an ocean early in Earth's history, but no life in initially. Even going back, let's just say a billion, just one billion years, a quarter of the history of life on Earth. There were creatures here, but they're all pretty tiny. I mean, just little guys. And photosynthesis, the forests in the sea, had already begun to prosper, to capture carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, to put oxygen in the atmosphere, and to develop food that began to power a whole new cycle of life. It's taken a long time, a very long time, for rocks and water and life to be able to create what we now take for granted, a living planet. Mars, you have to start from scratch. There may be some life there. Life probably has existed elsewhere in the universe and may still. But there are no elephants on Mars. There are no whales, as far as we know, anywhere else in the universe. We have things going for us here. Why would we think of disrupting systems that make our existence possible? When you think astronauts, when they go up in the sky, they have to take their life support system with them. When I go down into the sea in a little submarine, I have to take my life support system with me. Scuba divers, you take air on your back. That's your life support system. You take care of it. You want to know everything you can know about it. And then you have to do whatever you can to take care of it. We need to do that with the ocean. Because all things considered, we need to take care of forests. Rainforests are so important to maintaining climate, the diversity of life. But you can imagine a world that had a healthy ocean that could support the likes of us if the ocean really were intact. <clears throat> but you can have an ocean full of life without rainforests, but you cannot have rainforests without the ocean. It's 97% of Earth's water governs climate governs weather. It's home for most of life on Earth, and most of it lives in the dark. Because when you get below about 100 meters, it's pretty dark. You get down to 1,000 meters, it's really dark, except for the sparkle, flash, and glow of creatures that make their own living light. I wish all of us could go in a little submersible right now and take you down. <laughs> and share the view of what's there to be seen. I know, you know, astronauts come from high in the sky, they want everyone to know what they've seen, what Earth looks like from afar, and what it looks like beyond where there's... Ah, I want to, let's hostile. stay on space for a second. Astronauts talk about the overview effect, how their personal perspective of life changes once they're able to see Earth from space. And I want to know what is the equivalent for a deep sea diver? You know, you've been to these places that so few of us will ever go. What have you learned by seeing these things that we won't see? If the world is alive, it's the most important discovery. The deeper you go in the ocean, the less we know. It's like diving into the history of life on Earth when you go into the sea. Essentially, all of the major divisions of animal life are there, from the earliest forms, the microbes, the sponges, the jellies, the whole categories of life that are so unfamiliar to most people, and yet there are neighbors, there are ancestors, there are you know, fellow citizens, if you will, right on through our fellow mammals, the whales. Good news. There are more whales today than when I was a child. 
Why? That is good news. But we, <laughs> we love to hear good news on this topic. <laughs> and there's one good reason. We stopped killing them. I mean, for the most part. We still kill whales with plastic. We still, will, still kill whales by consuming their food. I mean, there was a great recovery of gray whales along the west coast of North America in my lifetime. Their numbers were so low in the 1940s that it appeared that they would disappear. But we stopped killing them before we stopped killing most of the others. But not until 1986 was the moratorium on killing whales commercially brought into play. And since then, gray whales are not alone in experiencing a recovery. Humpback whales, blue whales, there are more of them today than there were. But it's not true of all whales, like the northern right whale that swims not far from where we are here. They are about 300 plus or minus, depending on whether they have good years for food or survival or not. They're right on the edge. And they're not alone. The little vaquita dolphin in the Gulf of California. I remember when there were several hundred and people thought, well, I guess we ought to take care of them because they're on the edge, like the right whales. Now they're about 30. We want to save them, but we don't want them to save them enough to stop their reason for decline. It's the fishing. And that's also what's causing the decline of sharks, of tuna, of krill in Antarctica, around the world. We have had in our heads that there's so much life out there <laughs> that we can surely take and take on a scale that now we know it simply cannot be sustained. The high seas, woohoo, this year, big win for climate, big win for the ocean, getting enough nations to come together to ratify the high seas treaty. And most people probably say, well, what does that mean? Why should I care? High seas, they're out there. I'm here. But when you know that Earth is one system, what happens anywhere happens everywhere. The air you breathe, the water that falls out of the sky, thank you, ocean. Thank you, open ocean. We're a handful of nations disproportionately are extracting wildlife by the ton. And they're subsidized to do it with fisheries agencies, with money to support those vessels that are taking squid, that are taking tuna. It's not everybody, but I would say that wide, widely we have created a market that supports this extraction, this loss of life. Huh. About half of the major forms of life in the sea have been extracted on my watch. If we keep going, where will the sharks be? I mean, I used to be afraid of sharks in the ocean, or at least I was told I had to be, but I'm afraid now when I don't see sharks. We need them in the ocean. These are all great points that speak to the importance of policy. Yes. Do you have any words for our political leaders who are deprioritizing climate policy, like those in the Trump administration? Well, you can't. Um, what? You, 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 you can't modify the laws of nature. They're there. Look at the evidence. There are scientists around the world who have come together to try to analyze. What makes Earth safe? Why, why is Earth what Earth is? It's because it's a living planet, first of all. Rocks and water alone don't make Earth habitable. And understanding how long it has taken to get from where we were, where Earth was, to where we are, and how short the time has been for us to convert the natural living systems land and sea into whatever it is we want to make of trees, however we want to use krill or squid or tuna or whatever we take from the ocean. 
I think that you can make stuff up. You can draw wishful thinking about what you think ought to be true. But the reality is, based in the science that has been accumulating over decades, over centuries, literally since the beginning of humankind, we learn things, we pass it along. We learn things, we pass it along. And the kids, when I think of the kids of today, 10-year-olds know things that Einstein could not know. Nobody had been to the moon in Einstein's time. Nobody had been to the moon when I was 10 years old, for sure. Nobody had been to the deepest part of the ocean. We didn't have the means to communicate knowledge. Now we do. There's no excuse in the 21st century for denying that climate is changing and that we're the cause. One species consuming nature to the point where Earth is changing, not in our favor. I mean, that's good news in a way. Imagine if we did not know this, if we continued to take the last tree, to kill the last bluefin tuna. Imagine if we were still killing whales instead of protecting them. I mean, this is a moment that has never been possible before. Now, it's like a race. <laughs> we're learning things so fast, but we're not keeping up with the loss of the natural systems. It's our last, best chance to really make the transition. Our um, last, best chance. Well, think about it. Well, we <laughs> will remember that wisdom from you. It's our last, best chance. Sylvia, well, thank you so, so much. Just we one more thing. you sharing our I, time. I just want you to think. Imagine the world the way it was 50 years ago. I can remember that. Some of the rest of you might be able to. The kids can't. But think 50 years from now. Wrap your minds around the state of the world today, the knowledge we have today that did not and could not exist 50 years ago. This is the moment in time to be glad you are here, to be glad the kids are here. Best time to be alive ever. Thank you, Sylvia. Mm -hmm.